Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Nice. So I'm <laughs> the gradient here is a little bit off. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, chess and solving intuition. Well, let's see if this works. So about me, my name is uh, Nicholas. I'm a father of two, live here in Helsingborg. I'm also a programmer since the last 15 years and also an avid chess player. I've been playing chess since I was, I think, 11. And uh, programming and chess, they go very well together. So it's always been very logical for me to build chess applications and chess computers. I'm also the co-founder of Northlink, uh, a company called Night Vision, and another project called IRT. And Northlink is a small engineering company here in Helsingborg. We're 10 engineers. We like to build nice things, um, build cool software, and, and enjoy what we do. And one of those things is actually a chess product. It's called Night Vision, which is basically a computer vision program for chess. So what we do is that we take a tripod and put an app, and then we digitalize a chessboard. And then we can replace uh, electronic chessboards, which are really expensive. So at tournaments, they usually cost around 10,000 crowns, and we can just replace that with just using a regular app. So the last couple of weeks and months, I've been out in chess tournaments and uh, playing chess with uh, this. And it's really, um, yeah, it's uh, a very interesting thing for me as a chess player. So this is one <coughs> image of uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Jakob, who is playing with that. And he's just mounting that tripod and playing some chess. But that's not all I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'm actually here to tell you a little bit about a story at Northlink. So we usually do a lot of workshops. And uh, we try to learn new things and build different products and uh, different uh, like one-day hackathons. And this was back in 2020. So, you know, during the pandemic, had a lot of downtime. And it was supposed to be a very simple, small sort of workshop for the company. We wanted to have as a goal to build a chess computer during one day and then compete in teams. But maybe grab a beer afterwards um, and enjoy our time. But what you need to understand about this is that I have some really competitive colleagues. So this is actually the story of how I was defeated in computer chess and subsequently spent weeks of my life and thousands of crowns building chess computers to get revenge against my friends and how I now need to talk about this in conferences just so I can write off this as a business expense. So welcome to this. <clears throat> so the background of building chess computers with, um, <clears throat> with machine learning and AI that I'm going to talk about is that it's a very interesting case for just machine learning and AI. The reason for that is that it's a huge scalability problem. So modern chess computers, for instance, Stockfish, that is the best chess computer out there, it traverses about, I think, 20 million positions per second and evaluates them. So if we're going to use machine learning or neural networks for this, we need to do it in a very high volume to be able to make it efficient. <clears throat> This is also lots of fun, especially for me as a programmer. So that's <laughs> a logical way of spending your time. Before coming here, um, someone asked me what I was going to talk about. And I said I was going to talk about chess. And then they said, but it's scale code. Does it really scale? Is the number big enough? So I presented them the Shannon number, which is basically the lower bound of the game-free complexity of chess. Basically, it tells us how many half plies, half moves, how many possible game states that can create, be created from that. So for one move, that is, if you move all the pawns one or two steps, or the knights in all these maximum positions, we can have 20 different games. But it kind of goes away pretty fast. So when we get down to 15 half plies, that is seven full moves, black and white, white we have a huge number. So I presented them with the huge number, and they said I can come and talk about it. So. The thing is that since it, the Shannon number presents us with a huge uh, scalability problem, it actually is impossible to solve this with brute force. So you hear this all the time, like chess could be solved if you just had enough computing power. And it's true in theory, but we're not going to get there probably never. So what we have to do is that we have to build some sort of intuition, some way of reducing the complexity of this problem. And humans are really good at this. 
So a good chess player can intuitively understand how to assess a position and find a couple of candidate moves. So when a good player plays chess, he probably knows what move he should play even before he has calculated it, or maybe like the top three moves. Computers are, as a, as a basic thing, not very good at this, but they have become a lot better in the last couple of years, a lot because of more advanced methods and neural networks that has been applied to chess. So for instance, in this game, I think you can see the entire board here. This is a classical position between Fischer and Petrosian from 1971. In this move, the best move here is to take the bishop with the knight. Why? The thing is that way down the line, that white's bishop is going to dominate black's and knight. But it's almost impossible to calculate. You're not going to be able to calculate this by just sitting here and crunching the moves. Fisher just knew it because he had a good intuitive sense. So basically, building a modern chess computer is about solving this. How can we make a computer understand that this is a good move without actually having to calculate all the way down to the end? <clears throat> so when we play chess, we try to compare strengths and see how well a chess computer performs against a human or another chess player. And we use a score called ELO for that. It's basically a way of defining relative winning chances. So the best player in the world, who has an ELO rating of 2,850 approximately, would uh, win 99.1% against my ELO score, which is a lot, of course. Stockfish, the best computer, would win almost every time, based on its ELO. And it would also win a lot, like 95% against the best human player. So computers are insanely good at chess. They're insanely good at chess for two reasons. One of them is that they can calculate a lot of positions, and humans can't. But they are also extremely good because we've come so far in being able to get them to understand how to intuitively assess positions. <clears throat> it's also a good reflection on how bad I am at chess. So, going back to my story, day one, um, the first competition, we were supposed to build a chess bot during one day. What do you have to do to build a chess computer? Well, basically, you have to build an engine. And this engine has a couple of components. The first one is you have to represent the chess board inside a data structure in some way. And the simple approach to this would be to define a matrix, an 8 times 8 matrix, for instance, one uh, position in the matrix for each square on the chess board. But the thing is that we're going to traverse a lot of chess positions uh, with our program. So having a, a slow matrix approach is going to take a lot of time. For each position, we have to look up all possible moves, all attacking moves, and we have to understand threats and things like that. So it's going to take a lot of time if we do that for 20 million positions each second. Another approach is calling, it's called bitboards. Basically, what a bitboard is, is a bit flag or a bit mask that defines a couple of features inside the chess program. So for instance, a bit uh, mask or a bit uh, board could be all knights on the board, or all bishops, or all rooks, or all white pieces. What's convenient about the bit board is that you can manipulate them using binary operations later on. So if I want to combine all white possible moves and black possible moves, I can combine the bit boards and do a binary AND, and I will get a new bit board that actually represents those features. And this is really fast because I can use binary operations on them. So using bitboards, we are able to traverse a lot more positions and manipulate chess a lot faster. After we've defined a data structure, basically chess computers come down to two things. One is the search function, and one is the evaluation function. The search function is basically a way of traversing a lot of different, different nodes as fast as possible. And the evaluation function needs to tell us how well a position is performing. And it needs to be really fast as well. So as we saw in the channel number, it's not possible for us to brute force this. So the search function has to be somehow intelligent and be able to reduce the search tree a lot for it to work. One of the classical approaches for this is called uh, alpha beta proning. So alpha beta proning is basically a way of recursively searching a chess tree. So if we are going down to depth four in our search tree, we will recursively go down 
<clears throat> each of the states. And then we will flip the evaluation based on what player we're looking at. What we're then going to do is that we're going to prune all the moves that are not valid to look at or important to look at. And the intuitive sense here is that since chess is a two-player game, we can use the information that if black responds to white's move with a strong move, then we don't need to look at all candidate moves that are not as good as that move. So black can force me into making a position that I might not want to make. Then I don't have to calculate further down the depth on the less significant lines. And this is basically what alpha beta plotting is doing. And it's a really fast approach for reducing the search tree a lot. Of course, really modern computers do this with a lot of combinations and hacks to make it even faster. But the basic principle is the same. We use that information about chess to actually reduce the search tree complexity. A big problem with chess, though, is that when we're searching this recursively, we have to stop at some point. We know that chess is so complicated, we can't search down the entire tree. So what we're going to end up with is a situation where we have to stop. And in this position, white can exchange his bishop for the knight. And what's going to happen is that when we evaluate this, if we evaluate with a depth zero, so just looking at the board as it is right now, then this is going to look pretty good for both players. They have the same amount of material. They have the same amount of flexibility and pawns in the center. So it's a good position. But if we go down depth one, then white can actually exchange his bishop for the knight. And that's going to leave him a piece up. But if you go down depth two, then black can retake with his pawn. And then if you go back to depth three, well, then white can take the pawn later down at black's center using his knight or uh, his queen. And that's going to just keep on spinning. So the problem here is, when do we stop looking and searching? <clears throat> One approach is called Cuisin search. It's basically a way of trying to define the important positions or shallow positions. So what we do is that we try to define what positions are worth recursively looking at. And usually it's positions where we can't exchange any pieces. There are no obvious mate threats. There are no like imbalances in the position. And then we prune out all other positions except the active positions. And then we search them for an additional depth. This easily becomes a big problem, though, because we have to find recursive situations here. We can easily find ourselves in a loop. And it's going to get stuck, or we can find ourselves in a situation where you can exchange pieces in a depth 20 situation, and it's going to just expand and be extremely slow. So there's a lot of logic here to try and find a situation when we can stop recursively looking at the position. <clears throat> After we've defined some sort of way of searching the game tree with alpha beta proning, quiz and search, we have to somehow evaluate how this position is looking. So an evaluator basically gives a score, a numerical score, to each position. It's usually executed in something called a centipawn. So human chess players, they usually score their positions in pawns. So a uh, queen is usually worth nine pawns. A uh, rook is worth five pawns. Computers, for more precision, they do this in centipawns. So it's 100 of a pawn. So a uh, score of 0 0.2 usually means that you have a slight advantage, but not enough to win. About 1 plus 1 means that you probably have a decisive advantage and that you can win. So we want to train up an evaluator that gives us this score back. And this is executed for all the nodes where our search function deems is necessary. So it's going to be executed a lot. <clears throat> and basically, the simple evaluator function here is basically a linear combination of features combined with a weight. So a normal, a very, very basic evaluator function could be that we define that the queen is worth nine pawns, the rookie was worth five pawns, etc. <clears throat> and then we combine those and we get a numerical score back. But that's just the basic version. So a good evaluator function takes in thousands of different uh, aspects and variables into this. So material differences, number of attack squares, king safety. A lot of different variables can go into this. And in the traditional chess engines, this has been hand-coded 
by professional chess players, professional chess computer uh, developers, and it's been going on for many, many years. So there are usually very large um, linear combinations of a lot of features. <clears throat> Basically, when we start looking at this from a machine learning perspective, we want to emulate the same thing. We want the network to understand these features and also hidden features inside this evaluator to create a more intuitive sense of how to evaluate the position. So we started off our day and we built a, a simple chess engine. We started competing with them. Um, it all started out in good fun. The bots played against each other fair and square. But suddenly, the other team, and that's not my team, they got an advantage, a vicious attack. And it was then it happened. With many moves left to go, I saw a message in the chat window that the bot wrote. It was from the competition's bot, and it said just one word. It said good game before the match had ended. And saying good game before a match has ended is the worst offense a chess player can make. I was devastated. That night, sleep eluded me. The haunting taunt of the bot made me think of only, only one thing, and that was revenge. So I set off to day two, stepping it up. I started looking at a neural network approach. This is where it went downhill, and I spent the next couple of weeks with this. But yeah, anyway. So the problem with my first bot was that I used a simple evaluator function. It was too slow, not intuitive enough. So I started looking, how can a neural network be approached to this? What can I do to actually avoid hand coding features and instead getting an intuitive sense in my evaluator function? There's a lot of different uh, famous approaches to this. One of them is Alpha Zero, which is Google's version of this. It became very famous when it won a lot of uh, games. It also played Go before this. Um, but it actually evaluated to something called Mila Zero, which was a couple of very uh, intuitive developers. They open sourced their version of it and implemented it based on Alpha Zero's research paper. Uh, and it's based on a reinforcement learning approach. And it's also distributed learning. So a lot of chess enthusiasts have helped to train this model. There's also another model called Stockfish, which is the best computer out there. They've implemented something called NNUE, which is a very, very fast network for CPU inference, uh, which is currently just dominating the chess scene. But the challenges of using a neural network is there's quite a lot of them. The problem is that it's a lot slower than using hand-coded features. So hand-coded features have been refined for decades. We know what constitutes a pretty good position in chess. So we need a lot of training data and a lot of refinement to make a computer or a neural network play as well as a hand-coded feature. But the problem is that the network also has to compensate for being slower. So it has to be a lot better for it to be able to compete with a hand-coded feature that would be so much faster. <clears throat> so basic network architecture can look something like this. You take a position, you transform it to an embedding, which can be basically a 64 vector where each position in the vector represents one position inside the um, position, uh, the chess position. Then you feed it to a neural network. It has an input layer, which is basically the embedding that goes in. And then you have a couple of hidden layers where you train up a couple of weights, and you're trying to get those weights to regress a uh, score, which is basically the sent upon evaluation. So that's a very simple network approach. This was the first thing I tested. It doesn't work very well. The problem is that chess is too complicated. You're going to get the network to not really understand what it's trying to solve. Then I started reading up. There's another paper, which was very famous back when it was released in, I think, 2012. It's called the De Giraffe paper. It's basically using deep reinforcement learning to apply to chess. And it was a game changer for chess because of two things. One of them was that it was actually able to play at the grandmaster level. So a grandmaster is one of the best players, uh, very high rating. So this computer was able to compete with that. And it was trained using reinforcement learning. So it was the first version that wasn't hand-fed evaluation scores. So it trained itself and became a very good chess player. And the guy who uh, wrote this paper, he now works for AlphaZero. Uh, so he discontinued this project when he went uh, away from it. 
but it was the first one that actually showed the potential of using neural networks inside chess. And things have just taken off from there. The architecture in Giraffe is kind of intelligent. He understood that instead of just giving a position to the network and hoping that it was going to learn how to represent itself, he started refining features from the chess set and basically doing what an evaluator function is, but he was feeding it to the network. So he sent in global features, which is information about the board, but also information about the pieces and the attack vectors that existed in the board, and also a specific feature about squares, what is occupied. And these three features became inputs to the network, which was then trained as a neural network with hidden layers that, that was then refined to produce an evaluation score. <clears throat> he then used reinforcement learning and basically used an approach called TD, um, TD learning or <clears throat> an approach that basically trains the network to predict its own ability to evaluate the position in the future. So he evaluates the final outcome of that network or the match, and then he continuously improved. So the computer played against itself, tried to predict who was going to win from a certain position, and then updated itself and eventually became so good that it was able to compete with top players in the world. Another interesting thing that happened in this paper was something called uh, a neural network for candidate moves. So when using alpha beta proning, we can feed it in a sorting order, what moves to look for first. So alpha beta proning will work optimally when we give them the correct moves to look for. The best move first, the worst move latest. That's problematic because we don't know what the best move is. If we knew it, we wouldn't have to have a, a function to begin with. But the network can actually be refined to understand an intuitive sense of what candidate moves to start looking for, basically what a human does when he plays chess. So he trained a neural network to sort out what moves to start searching for. And even though it isn't as fast as a hand-coded sorting mechanism, it still became extremely good because of his intuitive sense of what moves to sort out. We then used uh, Stockfish. So I used Stockfish to bootstrap up a lot of positions and allowed it to mimic Stockfish evaluation score. So when I trained my new network, I produced a lot of positions and I trained them up with uh, Stockfish. And then before doing the reinforcement learning, it trained itself against Stockfish evaluation. And to get a sense of intuition, what I did was that I created this training data with a depth that was larger than zero. So that forced the network to understand features that didn't exist in the current position. It had to sort of understand what would happen in the future in the position. So the network then got a sense of what will happen in the position, a sense of intuition, if you want to. There was another paper later on called Lila's Chess Zero, which took on the Alpha Zero's approach. And they also started doing this with reinforcement learning. And they use distributed reinforcement learning. So it's crowdsourced. A lot of chess players are just putting in computing time to help uh, Lila Chess Zero become better. And it's played about 500 million games against itself. And it plays another additional 1 million games every day. So it's becoming better and better. And it plays as a better than a human level, um, superhuman level, if you want to. So I did this. I trained up a couple of networks. I tried out different approaches. And days and weeks passed, and each time I created a new engine, someone else would improve their own engine. If I added better pruning, someone else would add a better network architecture. It was pointless. Eventually, I realized it was time to call in the big guns. So I set off to train my own NNUE model. And the NNUE architecture is basically what Stockfish is using. When I did this in 2020, it had just been released. And it was originally implemented for Shogi. So a Shogi player used it to train a Shogi computer. And then they upstreamed it to Stockfish. And it turned out that NNUE can use incremental updates. So it eventually updates the model architecture for each move. And it makes it really fast. So it's about 50% as fast as the hard-coded um, counterpart or the evaluation function. But it has a lot more intuition in itself, so it's a lot stronger, about 100 ELO points stronger when it was released. So even though it's a lot slower, it's still fast enough. 
And the structure is basically two input layers. Each input layer represents a 64 times 64 times 10 matrix. This basically, for every king position, it represents the entire possible uh, chessboard with all the pieces except the king. And this creates a really sparse matrix, a lot of dead space, but it allows the network to be incrementally updated and understand a wide range of features. So this network architecture looks something like this. In the beginning, it's highly overparameterized. So it has a lot of input in the beginning, and then very few uh, nodes in the middle of the hidden layers, which makes it really fast. And this network, except the first layer, can be executed on a single SIMD instruction, or a AVX 512 instruction, which makes it insanely fast on CPU inference. So when I did this, I had to throw out TensorFlow and uh, all of the other frameworks and build it from scratch, uh, and just for it to work. But what we do here is that in the matrix, instead of updating the entire matrix multiplication for the network, we only update the mathematical uh, calculations for exactly the move that happened. So if we make another move, we update only that part, which makes it really fast, even on CPU. <clears throat> so incremental updates is what makes NNUE really fast. And we can change this on a single SIM instruction, such as AVX512. This takes a lot of data. So I created about a billion positions for this to work. Um, it was generated with Stockfish. And then I sampled from all of these positions to make it as diverse as possible. And then for each position, I made a couple of random moves just to add a bit of augmentation in it. <clears throat> the problem with that was that this file became really huge. So each of these positions is stored in a fence string, basically a string representation of chess. So I found a way to use uh, Huffman encoding to compress this to uh, 22 two bytes, approximately, which still left it large but maintainable when put in on a machine learning framework. The training process was then uh, run for seven days on a RTX 3080-ish card. And the results were very promising. The network reached um, grandmaster level, even though the sorting function was pretty bad. And it showed a lot of intuition in its play. And it basically outperformed all other network models that I had worked with. And I was able to get the inference to be about 100,000 positions per second, which is a lot slower than Stockfish, 20 million per second, but still a lot of inference calls for a single neural network. So the NNUE network, it produced some great results. I knew it was time for a rematch. So before starting up the application, I took a deep breath. Weeks of hard work had finally paid off. And I quoted the first person that came to mind, Conan the Barbarian. And I looked up in the sky and I said just one thing. Grant me this one request. Grant me revenge. And if you don't listen, to hell with you. And the match was on. And the final game started off. The network played by Black here produced some pretty interesting moves. It started up. It produced two pawns in the middle and pushed away Black's or White's uh, knight. Soon, it had found itself in a vicious attack where it had opened up the G file and put its queen right in the same line as the king. It had a great initiative, and I was very hopeful. And soon it had found itself opening up the H file, having both the queen and the rook on the same path. I knew by then that black had full control. Checkmate could no longer be avoided. Triumphantly, my bot sent a request to the chess server, and it wrote just one thing. Good game. It was over. And I, I was free. The bots then played another 500 games, but against each other. But that is another story for another time. Thank you so much for coming here and listening to me. <clears throat>